The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the 13th chapter. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to Jesus, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. He said to them, Go and tell that fox for me. Listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the, fir- on the third day I finish my work. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day I must be on my way, because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you, and I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Before I begin my sermon, I just have a slight announcement to make. If, if you're one of those people who really likes to pay attention to the sermon title, it's wrong this week. And that's my fault. I, uh, I sent my sermon title uh, to the office you know, about 6.30 on Thursday morning when I wasn't fully awake, I guess. And, uh, and I got my wild canines mixed up. And uh, it says... A, a hen in the wolf house. It really should say a, a hen in the fox house. <laughs> Foxes are a lot different than wolves. Uh, anyone who's ever been to a zoo knows. <clears throat> uh, but uh, I, I wanted to illustrate foxes very clearly because wolves may be, may be the, the nomads, the, the ones who sort of are off in the distance. You don't really see or interact with much. But foxes are the ones who come into your barn, or if you have a chicken coop maybe even, or just come in and ravage and take things away. They're sneaky and they're crafty. They're adorable as all get out, but they're not to be messed with. They're, they're used in political co- cartoons all the time. I, I didn't choose one to put up. I didn't think it'd be good to, to pick a, any one political cartoon and, and put it up here today. But you can always see that the fox is dressed in nice clothes, just like a normal person, and is talking to, to some politician and saying, don't worry, I've got this hen house well served. I'm going to be serving this, these hens just fine. And then another fox is saying, yeah, he's going to be serving him with barbecue sauce, <laughs> with mustard. Because foxes, we know, are crafty and clever. They sneak in and steal the eggs and the chickens. And those pathetic, flightless birds with zero defense, they can't do anything but fly away in a cloud of feathers and, and squawking. And the Pharisees in today's gospel want Jesus to be like one of those chickens running away from a fox. And that's exactly why Jesus says, you tell Herod, that fox, that I'm coming for him. I'm not going to be running away from this. I'm coming for that fox. Jesus is different than Herod and any of the rulers of the day. He's not a conniving fox. He's not crafty and clever. He doesn't use evasion to take control. In fact, he's quite the opposite. A woman named uh, Margaret Feinberg, a a theologian, put it this way, Jesus invites followers, but Herod commands armies. Jesus gives all that he has. Herod, like a fox, takes anything that he wants. Jesus displays God's power, and Herod desires overpower. Jesus refers to himself in this moment where he can flee or face the fox, he refers to himself as a hen, a mothering hen gathering her brood under her wings. It's one of the very few times in the, go- in the gospel and in the entire Bible where God is depicted using an image that is feminine. And it's a good one for this because most mothers I know will stop at nothing to protect their children. 
It's a fierce kind of love. The only people who challenge such a loving mother are either incredibly brave or incredibly stupid. Because a mother's love is not to be messed with. And this is how Jesus talks about his love for Jerusalem. And today we can say his love for all people. Barbara Brown Taylor, a a famous uh, preacher, said it this way. She said, it may have looked like a minor skirmish to those who were there, but that contest between the chicken and the fox, Jesus and Herod, turned out to be the cosmic battle of all time in which the power of tooth and fang was put up against the power of a mother's love for her chicks. And God bet the farm on the hen. There's a peculiar strength in the vulnerability which Jesus shows by referring to himself as a flightless bird who has no defenses. Instead of engaging in a battle with Herod, instead of running from that hungry fox, he sets his eyes on the fox house. Not to overthrow through intimidation or craftiness or brute strength, but to face the power brokers of the day, knowing that it's not going to end well for him and he probably won't come out of it alive. Vulnerability, very often in our world today, is seen as a weakness. It's something that exposes you. It's much more virtuous to appear strong and stable, to ignore the past wrongdoings of our lives. But we're all vulnerable. We all have things that we don't want to be exposed to. We're all afraid of shame and fear and grief. What are you vulnerable to? What makes you feel exposed when you think that you aren't enough, aren't wealthy enough or thin enough, maybe not smart enough or talented enough or kind enough or perfect enough? There's always this standard that we try to hold ourselves to by ignoring the other part of our very selves. It's almost become sinful for a politician to say, I'm sorry, or to admit that you've ever slipped up. There's this undercurrent that no self-respecting person would ever show the pain or the shame that hides underneath a cool and calculating shell. Worthiness then just simply becomes an illusion of perfection. It's a ridiculously high standard that no one can live up to, and it's rapidly becoming the norm for all people. In order to avoid scrutiny, many of us do what we can to appear strong. More and more, we're encouraged to hide or even numb those feelings of fear and shame and grief, those emotions that make us seem weak. But we all know that's not perfection. That's imbalance. That's not integrity. And it's certainly not what true courage looks like. Brene Brown is a renowned, she has different ways of putting, her, putting herself, but she's a, a renowned researcher, psychologist, therapist, social worker. And she's done a lot of study on what it means to be vulnerable. I first heard of her because a, a therapist directed me to her, one of her videos. And she refers to a kind of person that she calls wholehearted, which is in the Latin where we get the word courageous. She says that wholehearted people, the people that she's found in her research, who seem to have it all together, have just as much shame and pain and fear that everyone else has, and yet they still have a strong sense of love and belonging. She says the one difference between them and other people who don't have that sense of love and belonging is one thing, and that's the feeling of being worthy of that love and that belonging. That's it. That's the difference between being wholehearted and being broken. Not to feel perfect, but to feel worthy. Brown puts it this way when she talks about our children. She says, we try to perfect most dangerously our children. They're hardwired for struggle when they get here. And when 
you hold those perfect little babies in your hand, it's our job not to say, look at her, she's perfect. My job is to keep her perfect, make sure she makes the tennis team by fifth grade and, and gets accepted to Yale by seventh. That's not our job. She says our job is to look and say, you know what? You're imperfect and you're wired for struggle, but you are worthy of love and belonging. That's how Jesus sees Jerusalem today in today's reading. And that's how Jesus sees you. Yes, you are imperfect. Yes, you've got things in your life that you're ashamed of that you think that you're not enough in. But you are worthy of God's love. You belong in the nurturing shelter of God's wings. Brene Brown also put it this way. She said, vulnerability is the core of shame and fear in our struggle for worthiness. But it's also the birthplace of joy, of creativity, of belonging, Vulnerability is even the birthplace of love. Maybe that's why so many people are drawn to creative types who are so vulnerable and exposed. Why so many people were waiting with bated breath for Adele to come out with her latest album last fall and crank that hello song as loud as they could on the radio, a song that's full of brokenheartedness and sadness. Why so many artists live in that same space of total exposure, of raw emotion. Because they know that we all feel those things. We all feel shame and fear and grief. And in that place, we all desire connection, to feel worthy of someone's attention. And true connection to another human being comes when we allow ourselves to be fully seen. In the Christian life, there's no better place to root your faith than in vulnerability. There's no better way to grow the bonds of Christian community than by lowering your guard and being your own messy self. And by living as if you and everyone else is worthy of being fully seen and is worthy of being fully loved. If you your desire to be correct, to have all the right answers, has caused a rift between you and another person, you may need to practice being a little more vulnerable in your life. If you have done everything you can to cover up that grief, that shame, that possibility of your imperfections, and yet you feel no better for it, it may be time to start living with your whole heart. If you want to connect to others, if you want to really make it count, it takes showing weakness. It takes being vulnerable. It's counterintuitive, but that's how every strong relationship flourishes, by allowing your whole self to be seen and known. It's true of any two people anywhere, and it's true of God's relationship to you. It's called being human, which is why God became truly human and lived in a body and suffered through pain and shame and grief, just like the rest of us. In the end, this, this whole Jesus experiment that started with Christmas and goes all the way to Easter is really for God the ultimate act of vulnerability so that God could be exposed to everything that we are exposed to, so that God could once and for all have a legitimate connection, a legitimate intimacy with all God's people. Jesus knows what he's getting himself into by refusing to run and instead of going straight toward the very threat to his life. Still, he continues on to Jerusalem. Jesus isn't being a hero, not in the way that heroes in movies are. This is a journey to the cross, simply to prove to the world how profound God's love is. Jesus calls himself a hen in the face of foxes, and as he wraps his wing 
around you. He wraps his other wing around the cross. Because nothing, not even death, will ever stop God from loving you and protecting you. Because you are so worthy of God's mothering love. Amen.